Anthony A. Benedict Park. Short, you just say initial say A B Park. Now, um, parents on the maternal side and the paternal side came from Barbados. A B Clark, my father. His father was Robinson Clark. That's as far back as I know. But I saw in another manifest somewhere, her name was Alexander Clark. And his name was, Alex, my father was Alexander Clark. That's the A. Benedict Clark, Alexander Clark. Now, so I want to suspect that that Alexander Clark may have been his grandfather, 18 something. Because that Alexander Clark apparently had other clocks. One of them was Robinson Clark. That was, uh, that was A.B. Clark's father. Now, Robinson Clark had a brother called Alexander Clark. So I believe that that man who was Alexander Clark named one of his sons after him, Alexander Clark. So we used to call him Uncle Alec. So where exactly they came from on that side, don't know, but I know it, you know, they're on that list of Barbados. Now, Alexander Clark, that was Alexander Clark, that was Rawson Clark, that was Charles Henry Clark, that was another Joe Clark. So that's on the clock side. And my father told me that when the clocks came, they settled in, in Basel. They came on, I think he said he learned that they came. Montserrat County first, Monterey here at first. And then the government of the day said, look, we can't keep bringing these people all to Monrovia. We've got to send them outside to populate other places or else we'll lose the land. So that's why I started pushing them out. You'll go to, you'll go to you know, Crozeville, Pennsylvania, you'll go, you can't just, you know. So that's how it started going on. And the clocks then landed in Buchanan. I mean, not Buchanan, but Basel, like what area, in Fortsville or somewhere around there, I'm not sure. And he said that they stayed there. Now, he said when well, his, his grandfather died, his son, which was Robinson Clark, my father's father, went, all right, let me put it another way. The only place to go to school at the University of Liberia. So when they finished high school, they, said, they, blah, blah, they all came to Monrovia. And so Robinson Clark, who's my grandfather, came to Monrovia, went to Liberia College, graduated, and he started teaching there and stayed there and so forth. When his father died in, 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 in Basel, then Robinson Clark went back there. And he picked up his mother and brought her down to Monrovia. She stayed with him. You know, all the come up were related stuff that way. So when he brought his, 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 his Rawson Clark brought his mother down, that was my grandmother, and it was Jean. It was called Grandma Jean. She came here, she was a widow. Apparently, they said she died, her husband died. You know, you know, they put her die 45 or so. Forth. So she came, she stayed there with her son, Rawson Clark. While she stayed with him in Monrovia, J. Benedict Mason, Mother Bruce, all of them, the brothers and sisters. Their father had lost his wife. So he went and hung up Jane, said he won't get married. So he said, come up over there. So uh, Mason married Grandma Jane and took her to Arlington. So every time you see my little Bruce, he said, you know, Rilena, eh? where you part? Where you let I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. You know, that AV that he was somewhere, he used to walk home up me. I said, oh, <laughs> I said, but you were never related to him. <laughs> and so we always joke. So th th there's a connection all where somewhere there. Robinson Clark came, uh, stayed in Monrovia. He, uh, you know, and it was the only thing to do was a government job. So he used to teach and he worked for government and so forth. And later on, they assigned him as district commissioner. That's why you're here. I'm not ready, but oh, yeah, but DC Clark, DC Clark, DC Clark town. And you're going to swim. DC Clark Town. That's where he made his headquarters. But they used to send him roving, he used to go places and so forth. So as a result, he he spoke Pele. 
Pharaoh, and my old man, because every time it was sent his father, he would take this boy with him. So he spoke Pele, he spoke Loma, he spoke Madingo, and he spoke Vai. So he was truly into it. He spoke all of those things. Guess what? Go everywhere he would go, he carried his little boy with him. You see? And then at some point in time, he 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 gave him to his his sister. I told you all come up with related. Eh? My Robinson Clark, who my grandfather, and they thought Ross's mother were brothers and sisters. Yes. Her name was Amelia Clark. And she got married to Nathan Ross's. Young Nita was his grandfather, and he was Bill Ross. So Amelia Clark got married to Bill Ross. Again, the color for related again. So A.B. Clark and Nathan Ross Sr., cousins. So when you come with one person, you come with the other person. So, and so that's how it worked. Mm -hmm. So that's the connection with, with the Clarks, the Rosses, and uh, whoever. Now, Robinson Clark. He was district commissioner. And one year, 1919, he went to Cape Town. He said, he went to Wagabo, visit. He and Charlie B. Sherman's father were good friends. So they took a trip to Cape Town. And when he got down there, the superintendent at that time was a man called Robert J.B. Watson. He had a young daughter. And Robert Sinclair went home with the daughter. She got pregnant. And that's how my father was born. He come up with the superintendent daughter. And the superintendent got pissed off with him. And he left. He came back. He didn't do the trip or anything. But his, the little boy stayed with him until he was about nine years old. Then he made peace with the superintendent. He sent for his son, which was A.B. Clark, my father, sent for him and brought him to Monroe. And gave him to who? To Nathan Ross's sister, ma mother. So that's how he grew up there with them. In vacation time, he will go to his park. If he's in uh, San Miguel, he will send a boy there. So that's the connection with all those people. Robinson Clark lived, he died a relatively young man. My father told me, he said he died in night. I saw his name in the Library of Congress. I was doing some work there once, research there. And he died in 1943. Again, they all died young. It was 53, 52, 53. And uh, his brothers, Alec, Uncle Alec, he died in the, he died in the, I, I say in the 70s. Charles Henry, all of them died, you know, relatively young. But Uncle, uh, Uncle Alec died, he died, he was older, he much older because he went blind when he died. So that's about it. A.B. Clark. Uh, uh, we were born 1920, December, December 10, 1920. Like I said, he was born in Kippa, and he stayed there with his grandmother. Because his mother died early, after, she, uh, after, he, he, was, after he was born, uh, she didn't live too long after that, she died, and then he lived with his grandmother. And he stayed with her until, like I said, he was nine years old in the central home. He lived with Nathan Ross, like I said, up until he went to college, went from Liberia College, uh, joined the State Department. No, no, Treasury Department first. Then from there, he joined the State Department, stayed there. From State Department, he left, and then he got a UN scholarship. But the UN thing was just beginning, and that's what I think. He and Ellie Cummings, the same Ellie Cummings here. The father, they were friends from David Boys. They went to American University of David and they did a master's. And he came back years later, then Tupman appointed him a budget director in 1956. The budget bureau thing was something else. Um, there was a man at the back of Liberia called Louis A. Marvin. He came over to Liberia in 1945 as manager for. Citibank. For 10 years, he stayed as manager when his term was over, he was going home. By that time, this is according to what 80 o'clock told me. By that time, five, not five, so, uh, LMC, Bummer Hill, was producing a lot of iron ores that were making a lot of you know, money and all this stuff. 
So Marvin was at the bank, and he was going home. And he was a friend of Chapman. So he told Chapman, he said, you're making a little bit of money now. You need to set up a budget so you can plan for, you can budget this thing so you can get a bill done. Chapman said, oh, well, I know that, but you got to help me and do it. And he said, yeah, okay. And that's how they started. So then Marvin, when his train was going to the bank, he set up budget bureau for, 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 for Chapman. He said, you got to know how to manage your money, budget, expenses, so, 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 so. He said, all right. And so they set it up. Marvin stayed until 56. And then he went home. And when he left, he turned over to A.B. Clark. Tupman took him from the, from the State Department, Gary England, and uh, made him budget director. The other people who were working there with him was uh, Kendrick Brown's father. He was there also. And they did budget bureau. They stayed there from, they were on Ashmore Street, right there where they used to have the Defco Bank. Up at St. Maxwell's building. From there, they moved to Memorina. From Memorina, they moved to the mansion after 64. He stayed there with Budget Bureau until 1972, October came in. And then they switched over. And he, he left, he fired him. He said, I want my own people. He lived until 2005, he died of a heart attack. Complicated with, uh, uh, I think, where was it now? Okay, look at it. Anyway, when they found him, he was crutching his chest like this. So that's, so that was what, that was his side of the story. It grieves. Uh, <laughs> I think it was Thomas Joshua Greaves. He was a white man from Ireland. He was living in Barbados, like all the other people that planning this and that, blah, 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 blah. But he's a white man who liked black people. So he saw this black girl, her name was Adley. He went after her. And uh, he was doing a secret thing and they found out and the white boy that beat the crap out of him. Said, How the hell you can be sleeping with a slave here? Yeah. My United was 18. And so when the uh, people caught up when they beat the crap out of him, he left and came on that boat. So that's what you see on that boat with Adley. They ended up in Liberia. That's how he got to Liberia. He was a tailor from what I from. from well, my uh, my grandmother told me so it was a tailor. He came with Adley. Um, now somewhere there, somewhere I got a little, they got a little mixed up. But from what I understand, he he brought Adley with him to Liberia. Uh, But his son stayed behind. He had a son that stayed behind. So he was not affected. He didn't, you know. The son was in medical school in Barbados there. But they say he had a lot of temper, plenty, plenty. And they put him out of medical school because he got into a fight with one of the professors. So then he followed his father to Liberia. That's how he got to Liberia. Now that grieves. It was mixed, okay, you know, mother this and father this, so he was mixed. Came to Liberia, and he married a woman, she was half French, her name was, <clears throat> excuse me, her name was Catherine Bordet. Catherine Bordet, her mother, from what I understand, was from Freetown, the African, I have a picture of her somewhere, because I'm a picture of the old folks there. And, and Greaves were married. Catherine Bordet was Serenia, but her father was half French or French. That's where the Bordet name came from, French. Brought her to Liberia 
and they had 16 children. Yes, yeah, 16 children. Um, he, he was Catholic, of course. So, and I think they said they had either three or two sets of twins. Again, I told you he had a lot of temper from kicking out of medical school there. But his father was a, a, a tailor. He came. But this boy married to this, this half Serena, half French girl. With a 13th journey, they lived in, again, they settled in the same place. They settled in, in Basel. Mm -hmm. Of the uh, 13 children, the oldest was called Adley. He named him after he named again Adley after his father's uh, first one, Adley. And what he used to do was he used to send his girls to school in Freetown, uh, St. Joseph College. Uh, college was a high school. They all went to school there. And from what I understand from him, this is what my my grandmother told me that. There were no Catholic church around. And, uh, so living in Buchanan, <laughs> when the ship come off the coast to Liberia, there were no dock. So there were people who would get in the rowboat and come on shore. They come to buy stuff, palm oil, this, blah, blah. People who come into that would come up there. And he used to stand on the on the on the on the water side when the boat coming. He would ask them, is there a priest on board? Is there a priest on board? They say, yes, yeah, oh man, so there's a priest there. Then he would take his children and put in the rowboat roll to the ship and then the people baptized him. So that's how he used to, how he used to be baptized. Yep. That's how he did with all of his kids. Now some of them died, the boys died and so forth, blah blah. But one of his children was well, William Edward Grees, that Marcia's father. He was the last child. When he was born, it wasn't too long that his mother died. So he was the baby. So my grandmother, who was the next to the oldest, she took care of him. So that's the older mother he knew. Her name was, her name was Catherine Louise Grease. You see, so they, uh, so he was a Grease. There was some other brothers, but all some of them died and so forth. But his older brother was called. Um, Thomas Henry Greaves, he was representative for Basel in the house until 1958, he died. Uh, I think he died prostate cancer. So he used to live on Benson Street. He come up from Newport Street. And he turned to go to Bright House up the hill there, running corner, that's where he used to live. Next to Barker's Matthews. We we'll always back to Sarah and go to see him. With Barker Matthews, and then we we'll all will play there together. So Thomas. Thomas Henry Grease, according to T.H. Grease, but named after the, the old man. So, so that's the Grease on that on the Grease side. Now, uh, Thomas Grease, he um, he never married in a Christ, civilized Christian way. He never did that. But he had a lot of children. Now, all of his children were born on the side, the bachelor side. He took all these over. Among them was Harry Greaves, remember Harry Greaves? The older Harry Greaves? Okay, that was his father. Harry Greaves, when, 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 when they brought, when, when this little girl came to, 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 he saw this little girl, he said, I want this girl. They said, oh, uh, oh man, <laughs> that, that, that's all. He said, that's all right. So she pregnant, he said, that's all right. And so he took her. So when she came to him, she was already pregnant, and he took her. So. That's why you see Harry Greaves was dark. Remember that? Very, very dark, yeah. But Harry, but, but, but Uncle Tommy took his, the, the, the woman, you know, he brought, he got the whole package, okay? And so Harry Greaves, the only father you know is Tommy Green. That he took, before he was born, he did, you know, lived there. So, so that's the, that was the Greaves side. Willie Greaves, and my grandmother were brothers and sisters, but to him, she was the only mother he knew. And so she took care of him all the way, same to like real college and all of that stuff. After college, 
he again he went to work for government letting you know and again he, he was made revenue co- co- collector same all over the town blah, blah. i remember as a little boy i don't know how old i was then, but very small we went to spend time with him he was in senegal at the time we didn't know what senegal it meant but we, sent school. we just went there spent vacation there with him and so forth now what a you had shoe we had elbow grease we had marjorie we had milton greaves we had uh, marcia wilmot ethan kent and so forth then there were the other side we had sam shepherd uh, i mean he was more greasy you look at he was more greasy than anybody ever know called greasy i mean he was well agrees statue and then there was who else you know abertin were married to dr barkley tina barkley then there momsey you know momsey all right wardrobe so there were all of those well agree were married i think three times the first wife was gladys who their mother's she was brewer i have a brewer's aunt then he was married to again he was married to Ethel Greaves, uh, Monse, Walter Mother, and then to Ethel, which is Marcia. He died in 1960, no, 1976. The other brothers, uh, Thomas Henry, he dies 58. The others, various times. My mother, my grandmother, who was Catherine Louise Greaves, was married to a Pratt. The Pratt's came from Freetown, Mauritown. There were five brothers, I understand. One went to Buchanan. That's what I was, uh, Alfred Pratt was my grandfather. The other one went to um, Sinu, that regular Pratt side. The other one went to Kipamas. His daughter married Tupman, our Tupman first wife, Martha Pratt. Mm-hmm. So those are the three. The three, uh, three, the three of uh, Pratt people. Now, Pratt went to the one that went to Buchanan. Met my grandmother in Buchanan. That he was a, so he was a builder, builder, a contractor, and he met her and they got married. They had three children: Louise, a Bill, and Mama was his mother, and then they had Marie as my mother, married to A.B. Clark. Louise was married to Rita Was, and then. Fred, Alfred Pratt, it's a bad one, I'm married to, you know, Jennifer Blue, Chapman, they're married to her sister. And those are the three. Now, my mother, uh, Marie, she had six children, four boys and two girls. Uh, <clears throat> she, by the time she was born, no, 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 no sorry. They were, all, all the kids were born in Basel. The three girls, Louise, Marie, and Fred, two, two, two girls were born, all born in Basel. Sometime after they were born, they moved out of Basel, they moved to Kakata and lived in Kakata. When you go into Fison, they call it 26 Gate. That's where they live. Uh, the three of them grew up there. And Catherine Louise Pratt sent her ch- kids to a convent. And the boy went to St. Patrick. St. Patrick was open in 1937, the senior convent, 1937. So she sent them there. And they stayed there. After that, and they went to Liberia College. For Liberia College, they got married and so forth. And Louise had three kids. Marie had six. Louise was uh she learned secretarial work and she did uh sewing she learned sewing i forget who it's in now marie went to teaching as a teacher and then uh after we went through high school then she went to law school i remember saying to her i remember saying all the time you know when my children or my children uh, are big enough, they're going back to school. But I'm not leaving them, you know. And so that's what she, she, she became a lawyer. She worked with the uh, first, she worked with uh, S.B. Cole's father, you know, S.B. Cole, Eddie Cole, 
Sammy Cole Law Firm. She worked with them. And after that, then she joined the Tupper Law Firm with Broderick and so forth, so so. And then afterwards, then she was employed at the Supreme Court as Director of Research. And that's where she stayed until the coup. After the coup, she stayed to get her heart out. So she come up with what she's doing here with Director of Research. But by I say, try to fire her. He wanted to get a job with somebody else, but somehow she survived. So Balazé was a Catholic. So Marie Clark went to Michael Francis. And he said, oh, Bishop, I didn't know that was my sister. I didn't know that was my sister. So that was, that was it. She stayed there until when the war broke down, the whole stuff messed up, and everybody's kind of came on the side. And that's about the shape of things to come. And Louise, and Louise were Robinson Clark's sister. And my father's auntie. Like I said, he had uh, a Mia Clark who were married to, to Nathan Ross senior father. And there were and Louise who were married to Jay Parker's page, Willie Page. Oh, and Louise, okay. Yes, 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 yes. Wow, you got you got memory, huh? Marie Clark, she, she was she was a teacher for 16 years at Convent. Before she said, you know, when she figured it was strong enough, and she then she went to law school. So she spent those years teaching all those people. Um, um, and uh, A.B. Clark, <clears throat> like I said, he was the uh, he was Tupper's first he was the first budget director. And uh, and Marvin told Tupper, he said, you, you know, you're making this money now from the the IO money, you got to figure out how to spend it. You got to budget it properly. And, and, and Tupper said, well, you got to help me. What is the budget thing? So, you gotta, so he set it up. Because he was the manager of the bank. So, so the bank was right next door. You see, to the mansion, all this was there. Edward Greaves, he was commissioner of customs. He was commissioner of customs. Yeah. He started off with, you know, uh, uh, a revenue agent and moved on and all this stuff. And then he was also, he also was in the military. You know, something, I don't know, some kind of general there. But he was in the military and, uh, and he was commissioner of custom. Um, Tommy Greaves, he was in the House of Representatives for years. He was the one who used to get all the, <laughs> he was the one who guaranteed the votes for, for Basel. <laughs> if you got him on your side, you got him. You know, you didn't have to worry about anything else. So that's how come he, and Tedman were such good buddies. He stayed there until he died. Thomas Henry Greaves. Um, story about old man Greaves, the one I told you to go to the, when it, is any priest on the ship? You know, he, I, I, is any priest on the ship? Yeah, old man, he said, and he would come on. I said, he had terrible temper. He sent his son, one of the sons that I told you, was Thomas Greaves, the one who became representative. He sent to the store at the time the biggest traders in Liberia were the Germans, not the Lebanese, or long before the Lebanese came much later. But he sent Tommy to the store to buy a lamp. He you know the lantern to work. So he goes to the store, he buys a lantern, and he comes back and gives it to his pa, the little boy. He put the thing in there, the wig didn't come out right, didn't want to work. So he tried to let it, didn't want to work again. So he told Tommy, come here, boy. Carry this thing back, carry this back. So the boy carried it back to the German man. The German man refused to take it. So he brought the lamp back and gave it to his back. He said, he said, the man said, you're not taking it back. He said he was tall. He got up, picked up the lamp, and walked down to the store, opened the German man, trust it, and put the lamp inside. So <laughs> this one, my grandmother told me that story herself before she died. And she died 19, I was in law school when she died. She died in 1972. I think she was 82 when she died. She said, Tommy carried the hat, the lanterns of the man. He said, no, you were not taking it back. He said, to bring it. He said, Pa went down there to, to him and took the lantern with him. Hoping he tried to put it inside. <laughs> about that. I remember seeing a picture of her. I got a picture of her. She, <clears throat> she said one, one her, one her, my grandmother told me that, well, Tommy, Got his first job. He went out to the store again, a general store, and he bought a hat. The hat was too small 
but I used to have people say, you know, said he used to have photographers used to come on the camera. Ma, you want to take your picture? He said, yeah, bro. So she took the hat, put it on her. It was a little too small, but she put it just sat on there and he took a picture. And so that's the picture of all here when you took the hat with it. But thing. And I still got that picture somewhere here. And the story about that picture, when we were little children growing up, we had pictures of all the old people, all the people. But when they walk in, lost it all. Now, I just thought I was going to Abidjan to come back because I sent my mother. And I figured, I said, well, do not stay here and die? He will, he, but I let this book kill him yet. So I went to Abidjan and said, well, let me go there. Because evil was there. I said, well, I'll go there then. And just cool off a little bit. And people broke into the heart, took all this stuff. But that picture of Kathleen Bordet with a hat on. Marcia had gone back to Monrovia. And she was down the street in front of what it was called, what it was, buy your own thing. Central Bank, uh, National Bank, Ministry, you know what, Ministry of Education. Mm -hmm. And she saw mm -hmm. this picture and she said, Oh, I don't see the picture somewhere before. I don't see the picture somewhere before. And she couldn't remember, but she, it was familiar. So she, Oh, I saw the picture because of my replace. And she bought it, and she bought her own family picture and took it home. And she phot photographed the thing for her glove camera. And sent it to me and I showed the woman. Say, yeah, my grandmother. So I still got a little picture of it. it didn't come out too clear because what she sent it to me for, but in South Africa, she sent it to me in South Africa. She sort of like faxed it, but it's still, you know, yeah, enhanced it. Can do that with. But that's the picture she had when they put this little hat on her head. She took it. Yeah, I think her greatest quality to, to, for me was the sacrifice she made to make sure that. I always used to say my five little children or my six little children. So I think that's the sacrifice she made that made me realize that that was the greatest quality. Sacrifice for her children. Her father, A. E. Pratt, was a lawyer. You see? And so she wanted to do that also, but she waited until we were strong enough, you know, in high school before she decided to go. You know. And I remember when she... Uh, she, when the old man came down, he brought a whole lot of books for her, you know, sharing things that's strange. When I left Liberia, I left all my books and all that stuff, blah, blah. Somebody went back to Liberia, I said, Ben, when you go to Liberia, go to my office if you can. I know the thing all scattered now, but if you find it in my books, you can bring it. And he bought three books for me, and that's my prized possession. One book was a two volume book. Uh, 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 cool Liberian law book that my grandfather gave to my mother. And he signed it 1937. And those are the two books. The other one was Richest in History on Liberia. You can't find it any place anymore. And why, when he went to my office, he could still find it, I don't know. Those three books he brought back. So that's how she went, became a lawyer, she inspired. And it was because of that that she because when I was graduating from high school, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. And, I, you know, my father wanted me to, be, to follow him to be economic, but I didn't know. So it was not until after I graduated from high school, I went to college. Then I said, all right, yeah, I will do the law. And that's how I got to it. Yeah. Let me tell you one story about education. They used to have some books that used to be called, you know, like my spelling, you know, the, 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 the hard copy, and then it had a workbook, spelling workbook. All right. And so she would teach us all. I would sit at a dining room table, doing our homework and all that stuff, showing us stuff. And she was like on top of everybody. So me, my father here, I was never paying attention to what she was saying. Open, but she telling somebody, said, no, no, write it this way. I'm looking at it. Maybe you could try and go to it. And said, so, and there was a, there was a the spelling book, the workbook. She opened it up and it was a the thing. And it says that it read the text and then answer the question, right? So it says, I am red. I am big. I am brown. Children carry me to school. What's my name? I said, A, B. And you know what it was? I'm looking at the thing, it was an apple. I am big, I am red, I am brown. What's my name? And I read it, I said, A-P. 
So I remember that forever. <laughs> after school on Friday, you're allowed to play after school Friday. And Saturday evening, homework. Because Sunday, the tie even was just said, no, 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 no. Saturday, we'll do your homework. Everybody, we'll learn it. Be prepared for tomorrow. And we'll say, all of the kids went to college and they all went beyond college. All went beyond college. Yeah. Even baby sister, Eva. Leo became a doctor. Winston went on to do clinical therapy. At one point, he was going to do dentistry. Yeah, he got out of that. Then after Winston, then uh, Eric, Eric did economics, finance. Variety did nursing, and then she wanted to, she did pediatric nursing. Eva, LU, and then she went to London University and did uh, economics. <laughs> Well, let me tell you another story about Marie Clark. Uh, she had four boys. <clears throat> and, and she was looking for girls. So when she got pregnant for the, the fifth time, that one, not they say I was there. She, uh, <clears throat> She had a dream and in this dream, the person told her, he said, the, the, the baby's name is Goretti. And then she woke up. She never heard that name, didn't know where it came from. And then she went back to sleep. That same night she had another dream. The same night, the same dream. And she got scared. And she said, well, who is this Goretti? I don't know who this person is. So she went to the uh, convent. And she told the nun, or the, there was a nun there called Sister Diana. She told Sister Diana, she, she said, oh, but my, she said, but Marie, that's a good, that's a, that's a good sign. I mean, you have a girl. But she had four boys, so you have a girl. She said, but, uh, but who is Goretti? And she told her, she said, well, Goretti was an Italian little girl. She was 12 or 13 years old. She was killed. Oh, she got scared. Oh, Lord, Jesus Christ, you know, yes. So she was a little girl, about 12 or 13 years old, and she ran into this man. And this man wanted to rape her, or either raped her, and then he stabbed her, murdered her. And she got scared. She, uh, she got flustered. You know, oh, God. No. And she said, no, 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 but that's a good sign. She said, my sister, that would be a good sign. He said, the baby, the, the child died. And he said, but I mean, my baby would die. She said, oh, no, no, we'll pray for you. You know, the Catholic, everything will pray for you. Now, here's where the story turns. This one, I was dead. <clears throat> on a Saturday, she went down water side. You know, in those days, you go buy thing on Saturday. When you come back, you buy it. With, there were no plastic bags, so wrap things up in a newspaper. So she bought, you know, the, the washing soap, the blue soap. And the blue soap was wrapped up in a newspaper, you know, and, you know, and we were there helping take the thing. Also. And it opened the, the, the blue soap. There was a picture of this little girl standing up like this. Maria Caretti. And Marie, Marie Clark almost, sh almost shit it. She threw the paper when she started crying. Oh my God. Oh my God, my bitch, this is bad. She said, oh no. And she got in the car and called the driver and he ran up. Mama put to see what it meant, the bishop. At the time, we're not Bishop, uh, not Bishop Mike Collins, or I mean, not Bishop Michael Francis. It was um, Bishop, the old one who died, Bishop John oh, Collins. Yeah. It was 1950-something. And she showed him this thing. He said, this, he said, this is too much of a coincidence, Bishop. So he said, oh, no, I would, I would pray. But he prayed. But and she kept that paper. Sharon, this one, I saw it. The paper, it was a little girl and you know, she was like this, looking up at it and it had Maria Goretti. She said, what can I do? She said, oh, she, I mean, she guess she blew it, she lost it. But that's how Goretti got her name. So she was an Italian little girl. When you can look it up, you'll see that. Girl. But she gave her the name, Maria Goretti. That America you're going to, make sure you keep your things in your pants and keep your trousers zip up. If you take it out, and you get in trouble, when you come back, I will cut it off. And after you go, let me tell you now, 
I think you're going. You keep your thing you pay, you pay. If you don't keep it in it, you take care of your damn children, you come back with Corel. You back in? I said, oh. Oh, can you imagine they have invested so much in you to come to America those days, yes. right? Oh, yeah. Can, you know, she won't go because, and you come and mess up. Yeah, that's basically what she was saying. You know, don't go out there mm -hmm. and pay the fool and, and mess up and all that stuff, you know. But um, I listened. I didn't, I didn't want to cut it off, so I didn't take it off. Oh, let me, you asked me something. Something. One of my favorite things when I left from my mother. Mm -hmm. When I was a little boy growing up, we're in, before I went to St. Patrick, we were in demonstration school. We had all these American people who were teaching us. And I remember I used to be reading the school, the textbook and stuff, but there were all white people in there, blah, blah, blah. And I never could see any black people in there. My father used to come home and he used to bring Time Magazine, Life Magazine, Newsweek. There was something called Le Monde was from, from France, the English version to it, Ebony and Jet. So I asked them, I said, Mommy, I said, well, I will see any black people in Newsweek and Time Magazine, all those things. But I always see black people in Ebony. But I don't see any white people in Ebony and so forth. And she explained to me, she said, well, you know, Ebony means black. It's, it's, it's a magazine for black people. And that's why you don't see any black people in there. I mean, white people in there. And Newsweek and Time Magazine, that's a magazine owned by white people. So they only put things in by, them, by themselves and so forth. That was too small way back then. But then I said, but any all the same America, she said, I said, what's the difference between, you know, uh, uh, the white people and the black people? And she told me, she taught me a lot of things. She taught us a lot of things. I think I listened to her more. And, she's, and she's, <clears throat> she said, the Time Magazine and News Magazine, they are Negrophobists. I said, what does it mean, they're Negrophobists? He said, they don't like black people. Black people. They are afraid of black people and uh, they have a hatred against. And I said, but what do you mean that? But then they all live in the same place. And she was trying to explain, she said, yes, but they got some white people who don't like black people. And so you won't find them in the white people magazine. But if you look in the Ebony magazine, which is about black people, they will be there. So then I got a little confused. I said, but but then they're all in America. And I said, well, what's it do? So where do the white people live and where do the black people live? So, and I'm, in my mind, I said, well, maybe the white people live in North America and the white people live in South America. She said, no, 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 no. But that was all I knew, no, that we know North America and South America. So I thought they were separate because they didn't like each other. She said, no, 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 no. And she had a complicated this thing. We're talking about the United States of America means America. In South America, I'm going, okay, I hope so. <laughs> we'll put for Brazil, all that stuff. Again. But that was some of the stuff that she taught. The black people used to work for them for free. And when they stopped working for them for free, they got pissed off with it and they didn't like them. They wanted them to, to, to work for them forever. They were slaves, they made them slaves. And another thing I learned from what she said, don't ever use the word slaves. Say, use the word enslaved because they were not born slaves, they were enslaved. I said, what is the meaning of that? She said, they were made slaves. So, okay, you know, I never use the word, you know, slave, the word slave, enslaved. So those are some of the things I learned from her. So I remember about growing up, what I liked about growing up in Liberia. Well, you know, Liberia was, um, Liberia was an open, young, and developing society. The problems that I remember that we didn't have crime major crime. Somebody steal from you, they would come and break in front, they would steal one pair of trousers, steal your goat and run, and, you know, but later, life was freer, not for everybody, but for some people, but we didn't have the major crime that we had. So I witnessed that period. I remember the time growing up when there was no running water, it, you know, I remember, I remember growing up in Mama Point when they were paving the streets. I remember they used to have the, 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 the motor grader. And this man used to be on the, you remember the guy who, uh, Flemister, who was married to his older brother. I mean, his father, he used to do that tractor. And they were doing the road up and down. 
from American Embassy straight down to the punk. I remember when there were no street lights in Monterey. We used to go to the Walker Theater. They were right down on Broad Street, Broad and Buchanan Street, up a little bit from AGM, San Diego School. No lights. You'd be walking, go to the thing. <clears throat> in the evening, you're coming up. If the thing from Food Fair, if you're running just seven, something like a guest dial, you're coming back. One thing you can bring you back would be the car lights when you're passing. And the lights, you see it, you come to you know. So those are the things I remember from old Monrovia. No street lights. And Monrovia up and down, the street, Broad Street was big. I was at St. Patrick Elementary School. When you come, you see in front of the, the, on the Ashburn Street shop coming from the mansion, the old mansion. There was no road. We were there when they used to be breaking the rocks. The, the, the man used to blow the whistle. That means, yo, get back, get back. And they would take the steel mat and throw it with a rock and then blow, wow, and everybody started running. I remember that? Going up there where you have, uh, um, where Daily Observer used to be, but up there, I think, what Chacha they used to be in grass. There was no road there at that point in time. Rocks. Four men were cleaning, so they were on one side, grab it, and so they were on the other side, why I'm seeing all that piss. So those are the things I remember. Oh, one of it. And then slowly they began to build up with lights coming and running water and then traffic light. The first street light, street, traffic light was put up on Randall Street and Ashburn Street. You had a mansion right here. You had a traffic. And it, it, no, that light is still up there. It's not working, but it's still up there. The old one, it's still there. So those are some of the things I remember. <clears throat> Walker Theater was Ashburn. I'm sorry. Uh, Broad Street and uh, Buchanan Street, right there, something that got right on that spot. There. I forget how much to go by. We used to call it, it Matinee. Full 30, we used to go to I think it was like 25 cents for downstairs. And then upstairs was 50 cents, but we never went upstairs. So <laughs> never went upstairs. 25 cents were good. And then later on, when, 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 when George Pamel brought uh, uh, movies, you know, on the expanded basis. They used to have it there on City, what is it because my rest City Hotel. You know what City Hotel is? Mm -hmm. There was a time when you could almost go to the thing free. You had to take the tie box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you buy the tie, you take the box top off. And you take it to the door and put it in because we're promoting tie. So the more you buy, the more tops we have. You take the top off and you take it, it's a tie box top. Basically, you go there, you go. And at that time, to go to the movie was like 15 cents. To go right in front there, you still have little, 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 what, 25 cents. And then to go upstairs would be something like maybe 50 cents or so. And now we're upstairs. 15 cents were good enough for me. We stand there and, and yeah, look up like this. But you open right from the screen. Yeah. Um, Bogus Matthew, who I class with. John Moore, who was the pilot in Steve uh, Thomas' plane. Um, <laughs> Winston Bezlo, he just passed. Dominic Latte, he, he's still around. Reverend Latte's son. Um, in the elementary school, Godly Amadashi was there. Roland Carey. Um, who else in elementary school? H.Q. Taylor. H.Q. Taylor joined. Us in St. Patrick's in 1956. He came from, I think, from Quinn. The father was assigned to Quinn. Way up in Tapu Who else was there again? Strand, who died, you know, do you know Strand was there? Andrew Pine, Michael Doe, who died. So many others. Stanley Vincent. <laughs> you know Guanu, Dr. Guanu? He did 56 or 57, 56 or so, and went back to St. Patrick to teach elementary school. So we're sitting all in the room. Uh, August Matthew, that was John Moore, that was Stanley Vincent, and all, we're all in the group together. Guanu was teaching us reading and comprehension. You read, close the book, and tell him what you read. So we're sitting there in class. <clears throat> I got to reading, I passed my book on. And, uh, Stanley Vincent had his textbook. He got through reading. And the man told him, Guanu, teacher Guanu, he said, when you finish, the man doesn't have a book, you let him read a book. So he told Vincent to get a book to Barker Matthew to read. And Vincent said, no, he took the book back. So Vincent said, give me the book. He said, no. So 
the teacher took the book from Stanley and gave it to Matthew to read. He started reading it. He gave it back to Stanley. Stanley was pissed and he punched back at Matthew in the mouth. Yes. And the teacher, Professor Teacher Guano, he reached back in there and grabbed Stanley Vincent up in the classroom, brought him to the front of the class and whipped the stuff inside of him with a rat in. And Parker Matthew muffled with all swollen in there. And he went home, he came back the next day, he said, I said, I said, I had a muffy, he said, huh? He said, but who didn't eat all the pepper that burning me? Mm -hmm. We were in fourth, fourth or fifth grade at the time. So, so I remember that stuff very well. I had left Finland because after the coup, Finland, Finland went to, to, to jail, the same to Bella Ella. And then Ome Horace came, came to look for me and said, he wanted me to work there with them. I said, okay. So we there. One of the clients who used to have a Finland office came looking for me and told me that uh, his wife's mother had died and she had a lot of property. And among the things she had, <clears throat> gold and all of this stuff, blah, blah. But he wanted me to fix the thing for them. Because the other people, other children keep finding money, you know nothing about it. And so if you want to put something good for me, I'll give you uh, uh, some of the property. I said, no, I don't do that kind of shit. I said, what are you looking for? It's not a lawyer. You're looking for a crook. I cannot do stuff like that. But what do you want? No, 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 no. Your kids, I never saw them again. Don't be greedy for money or property. <sighs> and don't be stupid. Use your head. You know, let me tell you something. I stuck with the old-fashioned training that I learned from my mother, my grandmother, and my father. You know, the stuff that doesn't concern you, don't put your hand in there. Don't, don't, hang, don't hang out with the wrong crowd. Education is the most important thing in life. If you don't have it, in fact, I always tell them, I say, look, education is like a step on a ladder. If you go to the post office and mail a letter, you don't put a stamp on it, you're going nowhere with it. That's the same with education. If you don't have it, you don't go in no place. And, and you know, and so I stuck, you know, and, and, and I knew that this society was a hell of a society to live in, you know. So I stuck with them. I mean, I stayed on top of them, made sure they did the homework. They won't go this place. Mm -mm, no. How was it there? I said, no, no, no. You didn't, come, you didn't come here for that. Even in Liberia, when you come down and say, oh, damn, our friend still wants to invite us so we can go to sleep over. I said, sleep over? Yeah, sleep while you're bad, baby. And you can see your friend at school every day, yeah, but then where are you going to go to sleep? How much more do you want to see you again? Oh, that comes with some, come some, some other silly asteroid. They said they have a pajama party. I said, no, baby. Mm -mm. We'll tell you people that at school there, we don't do pajama, pajama party. Yet, huh? We do pajama when you go to bed. So the whole star value, you know, so I knew all of these things that people do here, but I stayed away from it, you know. No, 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 can we go? No, 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 you didn't come here for that. But that everything you said, what kind of that? I said, well, what did you, what you came here for? I said, you know what you came here for? No, you came here because you came here to have a second chance in life. And that's how it's gonna be. Mm -hmm. So I stuck with the old values that I brought from the old people way back then and navigated it here. And I think, I think I've been very successful because they all went on and graduated, you know, uh, successful, no crime, no drugs, no violence, no guns, no busting your credit, no living above your means and so forth, you know, so I think I've done well so far. You know, if they are prepared, when I say prepared, I mean academically or technically, either way, they can do a lot to help our poor country. Uh, and I'm inspired by the fact that so many of our people are still inclined to go back to Liberia, even though it's a rough place to be at this point. I'll be back there myself at this point, but it's discouraging sometimes, you know. So I think that when, when I, I believe, not the only thing, I believe that a lot of Liberians will go back home if the situation was improved economically, 
and otherwise. But now we have we having this other new thing that like the violence and stuff. You know, we've got this thing that just becoming just like this place. You know, it's, the lawlessness. That's my fear. But I I, I believe that uh, they they are more committed in in a certain sense than than I because they. They pack it. My daughter's still back in the bureau. I tell her, I said, look, be careful. Yeah. And I said, look, you better be. So daddy, you know, because three people are your first time, you want me to leave that bureau and come here now for good? No. So I think that, uh, and I believe that some of our young people would be willing to go back if the situation improves. And they are the hope for us because our generation we passing out, you know, we had a Tupper generation, and you had a generation after that with Talbot. And then after that, you had my father, then you had the Western Riches and Joe Riches, all this brother. So it's my way, our, our generation, you know, the people that they are, our generation is just about past, you know. We live in the scene, when I say living the scene, in terms of uh, physically present and also kind of contribution we can make. So it's the young people who are going to step into the, the puddle. And, and so there's hope. I think they would, they would do something. And, and it's amazing because some of them left there when they were small, mm-hmm. you know, very small, and they're still going to go back, you know. So there is hope. Marie Clark, who want to be a mother for educating her six children. That was her pride, you know. Her education. I remember once she said, when Eva graduated, when she did her master's, she said, she said, you know, I, uh, I've educated all my children. Now, all I want, and she looked up and said, all I wanted to do was take a mission and to a job at chair. You know, she was a family-oriented person. And I think she wanted to be remembered for her family. You know, she, she, I, she, I mean, she was family oriented. That was a family. That was the biggest thing. Family, family. Her, her, grand, her grandchildren, her children, her grandchildren, children, her grandchildren. That was all. And, and even she, she didn't give up on that year. She went back there. She went back there and tried to live there until it started mess again. She came back there. Mm-hmm. A.B. Clark went back there too. In fact, he didn't tell to come back. He <laughs> got caught up in the mess back there. Lucky live for him. So I think he, more than anybody else, not, before, not too long before he died, but waiting for the election. He said, after the election, I'm going home. Okay, what happened? I'm going home. And then he didn't live to see it. They, the, the, the old folks made a hell of a sacrifice to go to Africa, sight unseen, unknown. Some of them couldn't make it, it went back, went back. And I believe that future generations owe them a lot. So when you when you see all the stuff that's going on with, with the, the present leadership and doing messing up the country, all that stuff, I keep saying to myself, even though I haven't gone back to, to, to do what I'm saying should be done. I, I, I say to myself all the time, you know, we shouldn't let it go down the drain because those people made a sacrifice. They gave us a flag. They gave us a passport. They gave us borders. And put all of those four together. They put us on the map of the world. So that's, that's what they left with us. And now we cannot afford to let it just go down the drain, even though we have no control at this point. We, you know, we're just, we're just bystanders and see the thing go down. But we can't do much. I mean, we, it, it, that's what's so hurtful. We can't do anything about it. And it's just going down the drain. So no matter what happens, we still, and I gave my, took my hat off to people like Banky and all these people that who, was struggling to make sure that the thing doesn't die because it's, it's sinking. 
and thinking. And we who are still here, I don't know what we can do, but we can't let it die. We shouldn't let it die. We can't, you know, what is Liberia at this point? Nothing. We, the people who, we, the people who founded the OAU, they kicked us out of our day. Did you know that? Yes. No. They kicked us out of our day. We had people who said they made a making arrangement to go and do something that I think they were only, they said that we were, when Ellen left, we were only then $8 million. Hadn't been paid for 19, whatever, eight day, five or two or whatever before then. So she made an arrangement to pay. And uh, they left us with something like $8 million. For send that down, they never pay anything after she left. So the people said, you have no voting right. And if you continue this way, you know, you can't even sit here. So they did something, they made some arrangement. But this is Liberia. This is the country that helped to find found the United Nations in 1945. Mm -hmm. So this, the thing that scares me is that we can't do much to save our country. We can't. We, no, I remember Joe Richard told me one day we'll say that talking. Say, you know, Clark? Say, my people found this country. And now one of the things that you did today. Say, now one of them. But there's not much we can do because we. And they, they, they're not doing much to save it. They're there for themselves. So that's my fear. My fear is that there's not much we the the the, 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 the descendants can do right now. I just, we just we just watching AB Clark before he died. The minute the thing opened up, he called me one time. He was in Maryland. He called me. He said, "Look, people, I need you to do me a favor." So yeah. he said, "There are a couple of books I want you to get for me at the University of Pennsylvania grounded. Uh, I want to put a paper together, a reconstruction of Liberia." And I'm going to do it to be built just like how Germany developed after the war. I said, okay. So I went down there and said, no, but you're, not, you're never a student here. You can't borrow. You can you read the books in come here. So, so, so I picked him up. He went there. He wrote a thing about this, the reconstruction of Liberia. He took it to Liberia. At that time, Taylor was there. He went there with his paper and stuff. And he met Sarah Allen. And he met Shaw. He told him what he had this produce this thing. He wanted to give it to him. He, he said for the for, to, 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 for government to use this to, to redevelop and develop the economy. He said if they do this thing, we'll come back and we're serious about we just how you see the German people came back. And and, and Sir Allen said, Oh, Mr. Clark, I'll bring it, I'll give it to him. He said, No, no, no. I didn't come here to I say I made an appointment with a man. The man told me to come here and give it to him. I want to speak to him. He said the main sit on that, sit on that. He never saw the man, he never saw Josh Taylor. Every time that he would come, you see Shaw. He said, tell the man told me to be here. Can you tell him I'm here? He said, he said, yeah, we told him. He said, I'll give him the note. If you told him I'm here, give him this note, let him write back on the time to wait or go. The note never came back. Which man never gave it to him. He said, okay, fine. Then I'm, 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 he said, Mr. Clark, give it to us. He said, no. No, no. I mean, you didn't do this work. Why should I give it to you? If I can't put it in here, then I'm taking it back. If you can't see me, fine. You gave him the note and you haven't given it to him. That's why he hasn't said written back on it yet. He said, Sierra Allen and Shaw, he said, my man, he, put, he, said, he gave up. Mm -hmm. he, was, he did that stuff based on the, the, the thing that the Germans did to come back after the war. And, you know, so, so they, you know, so I can't see how if you go back, you try to help and say so they would think you, you, you know, you want that job and so forth. So, mm -hmm. he, and he told me, he said, look, I'm not looking for a job. Oh. I'm retired. I'm trying to give to him this thing so he can read it. If he wants to give it to you, then that's fine. Yeah. And he never saw Charles where he left. Disappointed, he came back with a paper. They, they are grazing Ghana. Mm -hmm. They call him Graves. Yeah. Will it Graves? Last year, father, Will it Graves? He went to Ghana to make a connection and he found them. He took a picture of them. I got a picture of them when he, when he met the Graves in Ghana. They call him Graves, Graves, and he made a connection with them. They all took pictures of them together. Brother that went to Liberia, the other one went to Ghana. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he made a connection with them. And Willie Gray took a picture with them. 